You're listening to a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Number four, six, seven. Well, hi there. Welcome to another podcast on the Outdoor Station. And this time you find me on the 1st of July 2018, somewhere on the Pennine Way, with Pip the dog looking for Rose. The story so far is Rose started the Pennine Way last year and did a section of it, and then decided this year to finish it off with the dog which was very epic of her and it turned out to be more epic than anticipated because of the fabulous weather that we've had this summer which has just been extraordinary and a proper summer like the old days when you were kids and used to play endless games of cricket however with the glorious sunshine comes other additional problems which you don't necessarily anticipate in the British summer (laughs) like endless days of sunshine which then results in all the burns and streams drying up and, of course, inappropriate clothing. So let me uh, just update you what's happening. I started from Kirk Yet Home today. I picked the dog up from Rose last night, who's done, I think, about nine days with the dog, who's now rolling around in the grass, just having a good stretch. I met them at Burness Campsite last night. Burness Campsite, very, very welcoming, lovely little place and Rose had sorted herself out there and I'd driven up and bivvied with her. Now the reason I met her there was the dog actually has had a pretty tough time. She's done extremely well but she looks exhausted and lost a bit of weight and Rose was concerned understandably that she didn't want to put the dog through another very long hot day. She originally decided to finish on the Sunday then because of the dog uh, she sort of took a bit more of a rest day and the dog's now got its lead tangled around the map. Get off! Uh, decided to have a rest day and then thought she'd finish on the Monday. Uh, it would be more convenient to finish on the Sunday. So long and the short of it is that collected the dog, gave the dog a day off, as it were, as much as a day off I could do today, which is the Sunday the 1st, while Rose decided to attempt the last two days in one section which is about, depending who you talk to, uh, somewhere between 26 and 30 miles. So she set off this morning at 5.30 with a little day pack, which was full of water, basically, about uh, 4 litres, 5 litres of water, which itself is 5 kilos, and a few essentials, and trotted off, looking very, very strong. She's actually in fantastic condition, so she's really mountain fit. And as it happens, I've made the climb up towards the first mountain refuge hut. I'm near, uh, where am I? I'm near the Black Hag and the Kern, is it? Now, so it's the top of the climb, basically, that goes down to Kurt Yetholm. And I've just ducked down out of the wind by a wall just to record this piece. So I'm about 3k away from the first mountain refuge hut and I've just seen a couple that have met Rose and said she was near the other mountain refuge hut and only about an hour or so behind them. So I'm hoping that by the time I get to the refuge hut and sit down for half an hour or so, she will appear over the horizon looking extremely fit and heroic. And when she does and settle down a bit, we'll wander back to the car, which is parked down in the uh, in the valley there, and perhaps have a conversation along the way about how her trip has been this time on the Pennine Way. Completely different to the weather of the first trip, so it'll be a, an interesting contrast. Now, our dog, Pip, is a lovely spaniel, very calm in many ways, but she's from working stock. And if it runs, it the game's on. So she's been an absolute nightmare to walk with. So Rose had her harnessed, and I've got a harness today, which is basically a long elasticated harness that goes around my waist. And I can see what Rose was saying, how exhausting it's been, because with ground birds and lambs and cattle... Um, if it starts to move or run she's up for the game Uh, and naturally she pulls and it pulls you off track or where you're walking so she was saying that when she's been at her worst she's been dragging her off the path and Rose isn't particularly heavy so 
the dog has got a lot of power and so I can understand the frustration of that score so hopefully that in itself will uh, have eased some of Rose's pressures in uh, getting speed up today. She anticipates it would take her well she reckons she should do it easily in 12 hours I think the way she's going at the moment she's going to do it probably in in eight or nine which is phenomenal going uh, but as I say she's extremely heel fit now so I'm looking forward to to catching up with her. So that's about it. The day is another glorious hot sunny day. Thankfully there is a good strong cool breeze which is chilling both the dog and I down which is quite nice. I'm letting her dive into any brook or stream or burn that we can find. Unfortunately they do tend to be just nothing but mud and she is absolutely caked in it at the moment and loving every minute of it. Plus I'm carrying a few litres of water for her as well. Uh, so that's one thing and the other thing is the big fires which are going on in Lancaster area and around Hadrian's Wall the smoke is drifting this way and certainly last night at the campsite the smoke was coming across uh, from the firing range I believe and the locals said that they believe the army started the fire by firing on obviously this gr- dry ground which is an interesting concept so the uh, there's a lot of smoke in the air but today in the valley that i'm in it actually it is clear and it's surprising how different it is last night it was a very much a smoky haze and uh, you could smell it for well anywhere you went really so uh, we'll be interested to see how that gets on and i hope they've obviously managed to get that fire under control but it's it's obviously gone underground now which is even more dangerous Anyway, that is my introduction. I'm looking forward to seeing Rose, catching up with the story of the Pennine Way for the last couple of hundred miles and what it's been like to walking England 10 days solid in glorious sunshine, which in itself is a complete miracle. Will you get out of that dirt? Come here. This podcast is brought to you by backpackinglight.co.uk. A small UK independent helping you save weight and enjoy outdoor life more. It's just gone three o'clock and who should I find out on the hills on the Pennine Way looking remarkably fresh and wide-eyed and bushy-tailed but Rose. Congratulations Rose, I think we're just looking at the figures. Nine hours, twenty and a half miles nine and a half hours 20 and a half miles congratulations well done yeah not too far to go now nearly there soon be able to tick it off and claim my half a pint (laughs) well yeah and that'll see you sleeping in the car all the way back so what a difference today must have been for you having had the dog today and had a few experiences when she pulls off when she sees lambs and and calves much easier with a no pack or lighter pack and, and no dog Oh, without the pack, because the pack, I think that it just reminded me of, um, you know, two things that have made it less pleasant than it should have been. Where the pack was too heavy and this weather has been unbelievable. I mean, it's just been blistering. Now, you say the pack was too heavy, but why was the pack too heavy? Because you started off with a, 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 a your base weight was very acceptable. Oh, well, it was it's still over what I'd normally carry. And um, because of the weather, I was carrying at least four litres of water and taking my filter and filtering water as I went when I could find it just because it's been so dry and between the dog and I that's how much we needed so add that to the dog equipment food and suddenly the pack's more like 14 15k as opposed to 10 11 which has made it quite a considerable challenge combined with this 30 degree heat for the last what 10 days yeah, we weren't doing too bad up until um, towards the end when the, the, the mileage ups quite considerably. And we came across Cross Fell and did okay. I mean, coming down into um, did Cross Fell to Alston, um, which is quite a big day and a lot of ascent. But coming down to on Corpse Road was really grim and just so little water about. And for me, the concern all the time is looking at Pip, seeing if she's okay overheating or thirsty. So every little stream, we were putting her in it, or I was putting her in it, and sometimes bogs, just because it was wet. The wet mud was cooler for her. So um, yeah, it, it all the things I hadn't anticipated and never expected this sort of weather on the Pennine Way. Well, I suppose that's the responsibility you have to take on board when you take a, a dog on a long walk, isn't it? It's something you had considered but I don't think you anticipated the conditions which obviously caused a little bit more concern 
but that aside, how was the route? What's the Pennine Way? Where did you start this particular t- section? Oh, I'm going to need a map really now to remember it all. I started um, Horton in Ribblesdale, which is where I'd finished the year before last. Um, and that section, those sections, that was quite a nice area. Um, and we, we, you know, did very well, I think, on those early sections. Um, you know, it was very enjoyable. Nice countryside. Few too many um, fields, if you like, with cattle. And obviously this time of year with calves and things, with a dog, you have to be especially careful. So I think I've probably added most days a, a mile or so at least in detours around cattle on those uh, sections where it went across farmland. And those first few days, what was the accommodation? Were you camping, wild camping or bed and breakfast, bunkhouse? Uh, mostly, mostly camping. Um, I think I've done two wild camps. Um, one was after Crossfell had another the next day was just horrendous i think that was the one i phoned you and i was all but in tears it was just blisteringly hot the navigation it was all over the place it was farmers fields and people's back gardens and higgledy piggledy and not very interesting and uh, it took me a long time to get uh, to where i was going dufton only to find that adam was already there he'd left an hour after me apparently from alston i'd left at six in the morning trying to beat the heat as i did most mornings and he told me that he'd walked the, I'm not sure whether it's t- t- Trans Tyne or something like that. Anyway, it goes along a disused railway line. It's fairly recent and it goes in the same direction, the Pennine Way, but cuts out all the, the section which had taken me ages through fields and yards and over stiles and goodness knows what. And he said it had been like a motorway, <laughs> really lovely. So if I'd known, I would have cheated too. <laughs> yeah, it's got your name, Adam. Um... Your name's in the book. So what about places and people and characters then? Have you met uh, quite a few people going along, doing the same route, day walkers or, you know, long-distance hikers? A real mixture, actually. I mean, the only person I met who was camp- through ca- camping and through hiking was Adam, who had a 65-litre Carrymore pack, that Jaguar that he'd had from youngster and big leather-heavy boots. Um, but he had bought a lightweight Hubba Hubba tent which he, he loved um, and hopefully I I made him think about maybe trail shoes in the future <laughs> other people there was a lot of people and also the, quite interesting the Penham Way cut, cut across people doing the coast to coast and Hadrian's Wall and I was surprised there were lots of numbers of people doing um, baggage transfer and B&B so a lot of people you know walking but perhaps with a sm- lot smaller packs and taking a an easier option but we're also discussing Adam and I about a bit like Scotland really that uh, his guidebook my guidebook was quite old now it's 2012 and his was 2017 had a lot more relevant information or up-to-date information and his last few days had been set out most of the guidebooks now seem to be saying 16 days for the Pennine Way whereas I think the Cicerian one's more like 21 20 simply because um, but as I say, a bit like Scotland, there are not so many places you can stop to. Um, you know, all the villages don't have the little stores or cafes or all the rest of it. So, although the path much clearer and easier, that certainly from the bog point of view, although it's dry anyway at the moment, you know, the downside is you can't get accommodation so easily and and uh, or, you know restock so easily. So the distances, especially towards the end, as you get into the borders, is um, you know the distance is much greater you're doing 20 mile days so uh yeah interesting okay, come in front. so the rural economy is obviously being affected everywhere not just scotland it's all the areas the where there's less people i guess although i would have thought that the tourism and the walkers would have brought some money into the area yeah i mean certainly interesting i mean middleton and tees and some of those areas which was so pretty to walk through the hay meadows by the swale, were just delightful. Um, th- there weren't that many tourists, and they, you know, talking to the locals, who are all, I have to say, bar one, being absolutely fantastic, really friendly and helpful, and, you know, people have given me water, I've asked for water, and they filled me up and brought me apples, and, you know, lovely, lovely. Now, I do know there's a story attached to one particular camping location or accommodation location, which 
everybody's interested to know about because I shared part of the story on social media and everybody wants to know the details. So do fill us in on that one. Coming into Dufton, I booked into uh, Brow Farm. And now this is because um, I try to send at least one tin of dog food and some biscuits and some muesli for my breakfast forward so that it saves some weight in the pack each day. And um, uh, anyway, so I got to campsite as you do at the end of the day, tired, weary. Yes, they're expecting me, gave me a parcel, showed me the back garden, which was a pocket handed chief, if that um, said they were shearing, and that's, that's where I could go. Um, showed me the toilet, wash hand basin, and shower in sort of outdoor. I mean, to get to the shower, you had to go through a uh, farm machinery and stuff at the side with a the um, shower at the back which was like well, it was fairly disgusting the toilet the plaster was all coming off the wall no toilet paper there was muck all on the floor the wash hand basin was filthy anyway I thought look I'm too tired it's booked I don't know where else there is at the moment um, put the tent up uh, I had a shower after washing washing it out uh, and then um, thought well I better settle up because I want to leave at 6 again in the morning so Walked around the farmhouse, knocked on the door, and uh, spoke to them and said, "Can I settle up? Because I'm leaving early." She said, "Yeah, no problem. That's seven pound fifty. I said, uh, "Hand it, hold, hold out my ten pound note." Said, "Just to let you know, this is out of all, you know. I've stayed in quite a few farm campsites now. This is the poorest and the most expensive because usually I was paying between five and seven pounds." Um, so she said, "Oh, I'll well, call it seven pounds then." And, to, and then the, the, her daughter piped up and said, what do you mean, porous? And I said, well, she, she said, it's basic. And I said, yes, there's basic clean and there's basic filthy, or not clean. And at that, the, the mother just went, well, go then, get out, clear off, get your tent down, go. And that was it, thrown out. So uh, I had to take my tent down. Fortunately, I hadn't unpacked everything because it was just too hot packed everything up and Pip and I trotted down to the village to find the Grandi caravan and camping site which is lovely if only I'd known I would have gone there first anyway sparkling clean toilets there was an area just for campers with the sunshade and tables to use really helpful I offered to bring a dog bowl over um, just lovely seven pounds <laughs> and were they um, you told them the story did they, yes I did they... I, I've told as many people as possible because I certainly recommend. Apparently, Brow Farm also do B and B, and I did speak to some lovely ladies who were staying at the B and B and said it was fine. You know, it was very nice. But certainly, do not camp there. Do not camp there. Well, there's a story and a half then. And you would have thought people who are living in the rural community understand what it's like to be tired, weary, hot, sweaty, and just want somewhere to get your head down and clean and tidy. But I suppose everybody's standards are different. It says it certainly are. Uh, it's some quite interesting places. Another interesting place was Clove Lodge, which in my guidebook says they were, it's closing and it's up for sale. And I met a few people who said, oh, I thought it was closed. And indeed, it should have, should have been. Um, but I must have just caught the owner at the, the time. And he said, yes, come and stay. So I arrived to find that he was on holiday and there was a young lad looking after the place and he was actually moving out. He'd sold the place moving out the following week so he said come into the camping barn which was very sweet downstairs there's a wood burner and shower toilet but there was all sort of bedsteads and you know things with stickers on that was obviously going to be packed and not packed so he sort of cleared it a bit for me and said we've left one bed for you upstairs which was up a vertical ladder like in a loft space oh yeah with so, the dog and I was just sort of Thought, I thought, you know what, I'm not going up there. I want to wee in the middle of the night, I'll break my neck. Yeah. So anyway, but it was quite, because it was obviously musty, it had been shut up. It's like a big coal, um, stone-built barn. barn. Yeah. 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 So, um, so I said, anyway, a bit later in the evening, it was really musty in there as well and really hot outside. So I said, left the door open and sort of said, is there any chance I could light the l l wood burner a bit later on? He said, yeah, no problem. Really kind, brought me some fresh milk, which was lovely to make a cup of tea and... So I, that, that evening we let, lit the wood, wood burner, which sounds bizarre when it's been so hot, but actually it was really cold in there. And it just made it really snug. And Pip and I bedded down in front of the wood burner for the evening. And uh, that's it, beautiful house. And the good news is, apparently the people who have bought it 
um, are hoping to open it as a and b which is brilliant because it's a, it'll be a really good you know, place to stop on, it's right on the pen and where it's literally past the door. So it sounds like you've had a, a variety of experiences with uh, the accommodation, but what about the wild camping and, and certainly the actual terrain itself? Again, because you had the dog, I'm, I presume you've had a few challenges regarding styles and gates and fences. There's such an amazing number of latches on gates and different types of styles, ladder styles, stone styles, step-through styles. But I have to say, Pip and I got into a really good routine. She was absolutely brilliant. You know, she'd, we got this routine on ladder styles that she'd go up, wait on the platform at the top, I'd climb up, I'd climb down, then she'd come down. <laughs> and it was like a, a really good pattern. Um, and certainly there were a few that I had to lift her over which is when the harness was brilliant or there were cattle grids and this little uh, um, harness I've got for her is brilliant because it's got the handle on although she's not very keen we just lift her up and carry her across also on technical bits she was really good so after land on Beck there's a, you walk along the tie and it's lovely and then there's quite a lot of boulders boulders sort of you have to half scramble over and then you come to the waterfall you have to climb up which on your own is probably not too bad especially with a day pack be a piece of cake but with a big pack and the dog on the lead it was like really got my heart going just because it was it took such a lot of energy because the steps up that through the climbing up through the boulders and the, the, the verticalness of it was quite something so with bits pit would leap up and then oh, as she does you know encourage her to sit and wait until I could climb up after her and pick the best route or she'd get, start to go one way and I'd say no this is a bad you know but uh, we did really well I thought considering and uh, I hadn't really um, considered that either I think the last time we did that was pe- climbing up Penny Ghent which was very similar more of a scramble. So had you not prepared yourself for how tough it was going to be in some places or would, were you just not aware that it was going to be quite tough because I always, I always thought the Pennine Way myself, and maybe this is the same assumption you made, was, um, you know, it's a long route, but not there weren't stages in it which were actually really difficult or scrambly. I think that there's definitely some bits that were quite, you know, significantly you had to take care and think carefully about, and, and with navigation too, some of the moorlands, the paths are not that di- distinct at all. But like all these things, as we've said before, it's weather-related as well. That seems to make a huge difference. Um, as to prepared, I sort of read, but um, I was just talking to John, who I've just walked across uh, from Brian S. with, and he was saying that because he was doing it in sections, he could recce the route almost on YouTube with people who've done it. So he had a really good idea of what the terrain was like for each day and each section he was doing, whereas for me it was more reading the guidebook, looking at the, um, the map the day before. So just I didn't have enough time I, or I didn't make enough time before leaving to to do it how times have changed really you think about the research you can do these days with google earth um, people's podcasts uh, youtube videos blogs social media generally in actual fact it it almost takes the adventure and the surprise away from you we you know that if you turn this corner, there's going to be a waterfall or a scene or a view. And the surprise has gone, and it's changed to, oh, it wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be, as opposed to, wow, that's fresh and exciting. Yes, indeed. Um, in fact, John was saying that because he sort of said, well, perhaps your way is better, because I'm sort of so well-versed in what I'm going to be walking. Whereas I kept saying, wow, look at that, or that view, or it wasn't like I expected. You know, the Cheviots themselves weren't how I had envisaged them somehow so uh, it's difficult to know what's right I suppose it depends what sort of person you are and what you want to how you want to experience your walk well I know most of our listeners are generally sort of towards the lightweight end of things and like to do the backpacking and camping if at all possible rather than accommodation unless they have to of course how would you say the route was from start to finish as a wild camping option is it possible do you reckon Oh, I'm sure it is. Absolutely. You, I'm sure you could do that. I mean, if you're discreet and sensible and things, you could do that. I only did two wild camps, in fact. One was to break up. There was a 21 and a half mile day and I just couldn't face another one in the blistering heat with hips. So we had, she was knackered, so we took a three-quarter day rest, I guess. Stayed over. Um, 
at Greenhead for a bit longer and then set off at five in the evening which was great actually because the next section was Hadrian's Wall and it meant one it was quieter because it's one of the most popular sections and two the light was just magical so we had a lovely I really enjoyed that evening walk and first thing in the morning along Hadrian's Wall just it was just perfect light um, the view of the wall the history um, fabulous and I uh, yeah I did a camp up on the wire on the on the uh, Adrian's wall which was basically saw a spotted little gateway I could get through into a sheep field behind a stone wall just off the track um, I pitched up about nine I was gone by six um, only one strange moment where somebody was obviously walking the track at like must have been about half past ten eleven at night which was a bit disconcerting um, but yeah that was a, a really nice uh, wild camp and then the one I did before that was uh, Langdon Beck I think I walked from um, Middleton and Tees and there was just nothing uh, accommodation wise and the youth hostel that's there worked eight dogs so again just found a, a nice spot in fact the view was stunning so really and I mean you keep mentioning it in, uh, in different ways but having the dog as company as good as it is for the company's sake actually creates a few more issues and perhaps makes the walk a lot harder than it needs to be oh definitely there's no question about it i mean she, i loved her company but the it, she's got some sore spots on her paws so every time you were going over rough terrain and like the made-up roads through forestry commission you were wincing for her um you know finding water accommodation uh, nipping into spas to get you know provisions I don't like to just tie her up outside. It's like leaving a small child, you know, responsibly you wouldn't do that. Talking of which, she's leave the sheep alone. Sheep alone. Gosh, she's a nightmare. Okay, well, dog aside, and let's conclude the actual Pennine Way. How would you describe it and compare it to something like, obviously, the West Highland Way you've done and TGOs you've done? Is it up there being a really tough route or do you think it's a, it's a medium to average route? What would your conclusion be? I mean, there's definitely sections of it that are tough. And again, as I said, weather-wise, it, I think it could be really tough. I mean, I've been really fortunate. I had good weather, so visibility is good, which has helped navigation. But some of the more sections, and uh, the, the Heathland and Commons, are really trudging in bad weather. They would be pretty miserable, to be honest. And there's a lot of that. There's a lot of sameness, I felt, and sameness on views. Having said that, there are some spectacular... Um, pieces of scenery and villages and, and Keld, all the little cattle barns and just fascinating pieces of history. So it's definitely a, a fantastic... I didn't really know the north of England very well and I feel I've got a better feel for, you know, those counties and that area because of it. So, yeah, very, very uh, enjoyable on the whole. Scale of 1 to 10 for toughness? Oh, that's tricky. It depends on your abilities, doesn't it? For some people, it would be really tough. And for other people, it would be a breeze in the park. Um, so I, I don't know that I can say that. Well, I suppose, let's put this in context. The spine race was on the same weekend. <laughs> and they did, they did the start to finish in how long? Well, they, yeah, they had a week to complete it. They've done a summer version now, in, as well as a winter one. And I had a few walkers come past me. And they mostly were walking, actually, not running. But the person who completed it this year was uh, 78 hours. 78 hours, the whole of the Pennine Way. Well, on that note, we'll leave you to think whether you're at that level or at the general hiking, backpacking level. Um, I'm pleased Rose has is, is completed it. She's looking strong, she's looking well, and also the dog, annoying as she is, chasing these sheep, she's actually recovered quite nicely today as well. So it's a happy ending, glorious weather, and I shall leave that with you until the next podcast. Until then, bye for now. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To hear or see more from our extensive free library, please visit theoutdoorsstation.co.uk.